Good afternoon. Hope you are all having a wonderful Electronica 2020 conference and embedded forum. Welcome to the low power section of Electronica Embedded Forum. My name is Ravi Ambatipudi, and I will be kicking off this section with a keynote speech on low power system design. I'm the vice president and general manager of Mobile Power Business Unit at Maxim Integrated, where we design power management and battery management solutions for battery powered applications. So low power is important in all applications. So before we get into this presentation, I would like to get us all on a common ground with some terminology. Just so we are clear, low power is important in big systems as well as small systems. The scope of this presentation is limited to those small low power systems that are battery powered. So when, when I'm using the term low power embedded systems, I'm really referring to all the systems that are powered by battery, battery powered electronics. So here is a rough roadmap for the presentation. What I find interesting is that low power embedded system innovation is actually directly tied to battery innovation. So we will take a journey through the history and look at how battery innovation has created many interesting embedded systems and applications, low power embedded systems and applications. We'll then do a deep dive into the current generation low power embedded systems. We will look at a few challenges and examples of solutions. When we discuss AI, we think of big machines like automobiles or data centers or autonomous driving. So we will conclude this presentation with a discussion on how to bring AI to low power embedded systems. We actually have a very interesting demo at the end of the presentation, which is a battery powered AI cube. So without any further delay, let's get started. So here is the history of battery technology explained in one slide. You'll be surprised to know that battery technology has a very long history, almost 2000 year old history. What you will see below the gray bar is how battery technology has evolved over, over several centuries. And what you will see above the gray bar is how the battery technology innovation is actually driven low power embedded system innovation. It all started in 1938 when a German archeologist, Wilhelm Koenig, excavated a strange looking clay structure near the present day Baghdad or Parthian region. And he claimed that it was a battery. This clay structure was about 2000 years old and resembled a battery. Although a controversial claim, this is probably the first battery and this was probably used for electroplating. Then Ben Franklin used the term battery. He was the first one to use the term battery for his invention, where he used several glass capacitors to generate electricity. Then Volta, he created the first real battery and he called it the voltaic pile, where he used alternative copper and zinc discs separated by a, a fabric that was coated with brine. Then a gentleman by the name of Carl Gassner, he created the first zinc carbon dry cell battery system, which was actually commercialized by a company called National Carbon Company under the now famous brand, brand name EverReady. Now zinc carbon battery was created in a smaller form factor and this actually paved the way for innovation and creation of the first battery powered bicycle lantern and the first battery powered flashlight. Then the focus quickly shifted to improving energy density and size. And after other innovations in nickel iron batteries by Thomas Edison for the mining industry, we saw the emergence of the first miniature RM4 Mallory battery in 1954 which actually led to the creation of the first hearing aid. So innovation in battery created innovation in hearing aid. Then the emergence of D cell created the first battery powered transistor radio 
And as you very well know, smoke, ba smoke detectors actually use uh, D-cell batteries. So smoke alarms also came into existence. Then Yu Uri, a Canadian engineer working for National Carbon Company, created the first disposable alkaline battery, which spurred new growth in flash photography. Then the very first NICAD rechargeable battery was created in 1963, which led to innovation in calculators, cameras, gaming and music, music, and until the first cell phone was created by Motorola using NICAD batteries. But NICAD batteries were not safe. And this, this led to more innovation, and then this led to the creation of nickel metal hydride batteries. And the first ever laptop that came out of rechargeable lithium uh, uh, nickel metal hydride batteries. Sony then came up with the first commercial lithium ion battery and, then, and that dramatically changed the game. Why? So lithium battery technology has actually created several types of systems from less than one watt low power systems to 50 to 100 watt low power systems from sub one volt systems all the way to 36 volts or even higher voltage systems and these systems have been created for all different market segments you have hearable devices wearable devices personal electronics for consumers healthcare devices medical devices drones for industrial applications iot and connected devices such as amazon echo industrial power tools connected smart meters 4g and 5g wi-fi routers and communication devices for the enterprise market so lithium batteries have made their way into all low power embedded market segments from personal electronics, gaming, industrial, enterprise, and medical. Why is that the case? As you can see on the left side of this uh, slide, since the advent of lithium technology, the energy density curves have really tripled from about 100 watt hour per kilogram to 300 watt hour per kilogram. Uh, lithium innovation is continuing with many different chemistries, such as lithium cobalt oxide and lithium ferrous phosphate. Also, lithium batteries are offered in many shapes, sizes, and forms, and that makes them very suitable for all types of uh, different applications. While the energy densities have improved, it is still nowhere close to the rate of change with Moore's law. Hence, a lot of care must be taken to get the best energy out of the battery that we have today. So how do we get the every last, how do we get every last picojoule out of a battery to create the best user experience? That brings us to the next section of this presentation. Now in the next section, let's look at the current generation of low power embedded systems. Let's do a deep dive into the systems and figure out how to extract every last picojoule out of the battery in these systems. So here is an example of a typical low power embedded system. As I mentioned earlier, every low power system has a battery which requires charging, most likely using a USB-C charging port. Every battery requires fuel gauging to determine state of charge and battery protection for safety. All systems also have a sensor or a set of sensors to sense information from the outside world. You generally have a microcontroller that processes the information and then some type of a user interface and a communication transceiver. Then you have a power management section that powers all these different blocks. So all these uh, low power systems have very common design challenges. So let's first talk about the battery. First, you buy a new, let's say you buy a new low power system or device from Amazon or your favorite store. Then you have to ensure it is coming pre-charged or that it has good shelf life. Next, in just in case it needs charging, you would like to be able to charge it quickly since you're anxious to use your new gadget or toy. 
Next, you would like to use the device for as long as possible. So battery life or battery run time becomes very important. So a system designer has to provide good shelf life, fast charging, and good run time with the battery. Now, these low power devices are getting smaller and smaller. Here is a teardown picture of an actual AirPod. And as you can see, you don't even have the space for a US dime to fit in. Some of these next generation low power systems are in close contact with your skin. These devices that go into your ear or in contact with your skin uh, cannot really get uh, too hot. It'll be a very unpleasant experience if your earbud or wearable device gets very hot. So special attention must be paid for thermal performance. Next, noise and signal integrity and quality of communication is also important. So now let's use some examples to understand the trade-offs of a good system designer must make to design these low power systems. Now let's talk about this skydiver. So this skydiver, he has bought a new action camera, let's say. Now he's very anxious to use his new gadget so he opens his package and finds out that it is not charged and the battery has been sitting on the shelf and completely discharged. So he must be pretty disappointed. So system designers have to work on customer delight. As I mentioned earlier, customer delight is extremely important. After a new purchase, manufacturers want to delight their end users by not requiring them to charge before their first use. So, this requires the battery shelf life to be very long. So what determines the battery shelf life? Quiescent current is the single most determining factor for shelf life. So an, an, a fuel gauge with seven microamp IQ, one of Maxim's ICs, generally gives you over 50 months of shelf life. So lower the IQ, the better the shelf life. Now let's say our skydiver is using a camera that is powered by the seven microamp fuel gauge. Now it's almost done with, it, with his endeavor uh, of skydiving and he's capturing the final moments of his skydiving experience. And then the camera shuts down. He thinks he has another 10 minutes but the fuel gauge is not accurate or erroneous and shuts down prematurely. So having a more accurate fuel gauge may mean several tens of minutes of experience and customer delight. So an accurate fuel gauge is needed to prevent premature or abrupt shutdown. So one more thing, typical fuel gauges require the battery to be characterized for best performance and that may take a long time for a system designer. Now this can mean several weeks. In a fast time to market uh, situation, system designers can now use more advanced algorithms such as Maxim's model gauge that actually completely eliminates characterization and still provides you very good accuracy. Now I want to take you back to a slide that we saw earlier on uh, energy density of the battery. So um, as we saw earlier, lithium ion battery energy density is increasing not as fast as the parabolic Morse law, but almost exponentially. But increased energy density does not come for free. Increased density has a lot of other consequences, especially for safety, as a separator, the battery separator becomes thinner uh, and safety becomes critical. Some batteries age, uh, they can actually develop tiny internal shards due to harsh operating conditions, which can get aggravated by latent uh, manufacturing defects. So in some rare cases, these shorts can grow and result in um, thermal runaway conditions. So you need fuel gauges that can actually detect internal self-discharge and can help identify potential hazardous uh, batteries. So system designers, can select fuel gauge IC that can alert the system or shut off the battery at programmable internal self uh, discharge levels. So what you see on the right side is that the test result in teal that shows the measured leakage of a normal battery at close to zero milliamps of leakage or no leakage as expected. Now, 
when a 900 ohm leak is actually added to simulate a leak in a potential hazardous battery, the test result in orange shows the leakage with the fuel gauge IC, which has internal self-discharge protection. Now, this fuel gauge IC, it measures about 4 milliamps of internal leakage. It, now, this, it's also important that the algorithm for measuring this leakage, this internal self-discharge leakage, is not affected by variations in operating temp temperature. This is very important to prevent uh, false alarms. Now, let us talk about fast charging. Now, all of us want to charge our devices faster. However, fast charging is not possible by simply increasing the power level of the charger. Why? Because it also adds more power dissipation and may actually heat up the device. These devices, such as this virtual reality goggle that you're seeing on the screen, this is, this has, this is in close contact with the skin and increased heat is not good. So just increasing the power level may heat up the device and make it unsafe or make it very uncomfortable to touch. So what is the solution? Well, high efficiency is paramount to enable fast charging. Now let's consider the example of a USB-C power delivery charger for a high capacity one cell battery. Now let's compare two chargers, one in teal color and another in red color. Now, the teal color high C has about 7% higher efficiency at about 4.5 amps current level, charging current level. Now this allows this IC, the teal color IC, to charge at a higher current level while keeping the temperature low. The temperature is low because efficiency is 7% higher. So that's why you are able to deliver much more current, charge at a much higher current level without increasing the temperature. Now. This also allows the teal color IC to charge at a rate that is 35% faster than the red color charger. So all in all, you're able to charge at a much faster rate with the higher efficiency teal color charging IC compared to the red color charging IC. So teal color IC provides you faster charging without increasing heat dissipation in these devices that are in close contact with your skin. So we have looked at fuel gauges and chargers. Now let's look at the challenges that the system designers are facing with power management and DC-DC converters. So, well, for a power management designer, the first question is how many voltage rails do I need? In a typical low power, hearable, wearable, IoT, or AI system, you have many sensors. Temperature sensors, heart rate monitors, SpO2 sensor. You may have a biometric sensor hub. You may have an accelerometer and a gyroscope, audio amplifier, GPS system, Bluetooth Wi-Fi receiver, RF module, microcontroller, and an LED display. So the power management designer has to find a way to provide power supplies to all these different sensors, microcontrollers, and UI subsystems, all in a very small form factor while keeping the small solution size, battery life, and noise sensitivity in mind. Now, every one of these elements, the microcontroller, the audio amplifier, the, all the sensors, the LED display, they all need a voltage rail. But look at the form factor of some of these low power systems, extremely compact. How does one provide power to all these different elements, all these different rails, especially when one considers power management as an afterthought? You design your whole system, and then you wonder, how am I going to power this system? Also, space is limited. Battery life is important and low noise is critical. So you have to use switching regulators because of efficiency in space, but you need one inductor for every switching regulator and they are noisy. If you build a system with a traditional power management solution, whether you're using a standalone discrete switching DC-DC converter or an integrated power management IC, PMIC, the solution is likely to be too large. 
So here's an example of a traditional solution which uses four switching regulators with four inductors. The solution is too big and cannot fit in most of these low power systems. So what is the alternative? The alternative is a breakthrough technology, which is called SIMO, which provides uh, four outputs using a single inductor. And as you can see, the solution is significantly smaller. Solution is extremely flexible. You can have three outputs, four outputs, step up outputs, step down outputs, step up, step down outputs, all of that, the same topology. So you may be wondering, what is this topology? How does this work? So in SIMO architecture, we typically have one inductor and three or four output voltage channels. In this example here, we are showing three output channels. The inductor is actually time multiplexed between multiple switching regulators with a specialized controller that manages the current flow to each rail. Now, this architecture, it allows each voltage rail to be individually programmed providing designers with the greatest degree of flexibility. Now, this architecture is quite flexible and can be used in many different innovative ways. For example, one can use one of the channels as a charger for uh, hearable, uh, you know, hearable devices and attain four times faster charging than a conventional solution. Overall, the solution is often more than 50% smaller, and you do see 68% reduction in bill of material. So we started the presentation by looking at how battery innovation has driven low power system innovation over the past several centuries. We then did a deep dive on current generation low power embedded systems, and we looked at all the system level design challenges, and we looked at the fuel gauging, battery charging, and power management solutions. That brings us to this last section on how to bring artificial intelligence, AI, to low power embedded systems. So far we have reviewed what can be done with fuel gauges, battery chargers, and power management architectures to really help out the supply side. But the site consuming the power, the power consumer, has also been critical for building the IoT and enabling edge devices to do more. But, the, but today, the edge often collects data to send to the cloud for processing. So the intelligence isn't always at the edge, but it's a significant latency and power delay away from, off in the cloud. But what if you could have that intelligence the artificial intelligence there at the edge. Believe it or not, Maxim is working here too. And we have a lofty mission. We see the big machines today that are capable of amazing AI tasks. They can process spoken language. They can navigate the streets of our larger cities. This is what we really have in mind when we think about AI, the ability to see and hear like humans. But those things aren't really embedded all the clever work we have talked about to improve battery management and power efficiency doesn't really apply there. It applies to small machines. However, today these small machines aren't participating in the AI movement, except for simple wake word or simple sensor analysis, the cost and space and power constraint embedded devices aren't capable of AI uh, computations. So Maxim's mission is to enable these devices to see and hear. The technology for enabling AI in low power embedded systems has never been available to do this. So while we can imagine some things that can be done with edge AI capability, we learn more every day as we talk to new people with new ideas. Factory robots can become safer if they can decide without a network connection that they are around humans. Power tools can become safer too if they can move more quickly figure out based on what they see and what they not what they hear, that they're about to put somebody's safety at risk. Vacuum robots can become more independent if they can do a better job figuring out when they're going to get stuck. Cameras can become more wireless and ubiquitous with advanced features like people counting or identifying objects like animals or bicycles. 
we can start putting our AI imaginations to work. Why? Because Maxim has now enabled the demand side of the low power equation to do much more, to become fully and truly intelligent. What you're seeing on this slide is a recently released specialized hardware neural network accelerator. Now, this accelerator makes edge inference fast and with low energy and in a form factor that works with space and cost constrained low power embedded systems. Now, let us turn our attention to a demo that is enabled by this neural network accelerator. The face identification demonstration will start with a keyword activation. On. Go. Stop. Off. What you have seen and heard is actually our camera cube demo. We call it camera cube. Um, it's enabled by the AI accelerator. More precisely, you saw a low power keyword spotting being used to activate the camera and turn on the face ID application. And then you saw our AI chip starting to process images and run face ID. When the box is red, it doesn't spot facial features. When it turns orange, it sees facial features but can't really figure out who it sees. And when it, when it finally turns green, it has made a positive ID. So there are a few really amazing things here. First is that we are seeing real vision AI applications in a small form factor running off a battery. We have closed the AI gap for embedded, low power embedded systems with this. Now, but this battery will last long because the accelerator, um, you know, it inferences hundreds of times faster and lower energy than microcontrollers. In fact, we have made the energy cost of inferences like face ID so low that it has become really, um, uh, you know, nearly inconsequential. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. As you can see, on the source side, battery innovation is critical for system innovation and the future is looking bright for energy density of the batteries. We have reviewed power management and battery management technologies that are capable of maximizing battery life, maximizing battery safety, and managing every last picojoule out of battery. The future is bright and with the camera cube demo that we saw, the demo that was enabled by the AI accelerator, we are seeing the very real possibility and interesting possibilities of AI actually being enabled on these battery power devices, low power embedded systems, you know, AI being really available on the edge. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for watching the presentation. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.